Should I turn it off when I'm speaking? Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the AC, it's not audible as such. I think it's Sorry. fine with you switching on the AC. Probably, because it's warm here. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. I am Shamana Biswas, and I welcome you all to this panel discussion on cultural identity and ideology curated under TMYS review in association with Oxford University Press. Under this theme, TMYS review December 2022 will explore the role of artistic endeavors of society in shaping cultural identity and ideology. Uh, I would also like to say that we are calling for submission of stories, essays and poems and for project architecture and submission guidelines, please visit www.tellmeyourstory.biz. Uh, today's topic of discussion is serialized representation of folklore's episodic culture. We are honored to have with us Guru Sharon Lowen, Dr. Andrew Alter, Dr. Arjun Raina, Dr. Umesh Patra, and Professor Mohan Dangaura as our esteemed speakers for the panel. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I shall now quickly introduce our speakers. Sharon Lowen is a renowned classical dancer teacher, choreographer, and scholar, presenting and promoting Indian classical throughout India, North and South America, Europe, Africa, South and Southeast Asia, the Middle East and Japan, since she first came to India in 1973 as a Fulbright scholar. She is trained in Odissi, Manipuri, Mayur Bhanj, and Saraitela Chow, and the founder of the NGO Trust, Manasa, uh, Art Without Frontiers. Her recent books are Shringara in Classical Indian Dance, published in the year 2020, and Art Without Frontiers, Classical Dance and Music of India, published in the year 2019. Andrew Alter is an Associate Professor in Music Studies at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. He teaches in a diverse range of sub-disciplines, including popular music studies, ethnomusicology, composition and music theory. His primary research is in the music of South Asia with a focus on traditional music from the Himalaya. He has published two books, namely Dancing with Devtas, Drums, Power and Possession um, in the Music of Kharwar, North India in the year 2008 and Mountainous Sound Spaces, Listening to History and Music in the year 2014. He directs the Macquarie University Gameland Ensemble, working with students and colleagues on various contemporary fusion projects inspired by the music of India, Ireland, West Java, Bali, and Jazz. Dr. Arjun Raina is an independent artist, contemporary playwright and performer, practically dancer, and an academic living in Australia. He has pursued his PhD from Flinders University researching the teaching of Kathakali in Australia from 2014 to 2018. His monograph include Teaching Kathakali in Australia, Mirroring the Master, published in the year 2020. He has worked as a professor of contemporary acting at the Ambedkar University and the National School of Drama. At National School of Drama, he taught acting to a generation of students now leading actors on stage and cinema in India. His play, The Magic Art, is recognized as a significant work of interculturalism. Umesh Patra teaches English at Mahatma Gandhi Central University, Motihari. He worked on a comparative analysis of an Oriya folk theater named Pala and Bertolt Brecht's epic theater for his PhD dissertation at EFLU, Hyderabad. His writings have been published in several periodicals such as Sanglab, Research and Criticism, News India, The Hindu, and Economics and Political Weekly. Some of his lectures are uploaded in e Vimarsh and MGCU ICT Initiative. Mohan Dangaura is an MPhil graduate in English Literature from Tribhuvan University, Nepal. He has received his MA from the same university in the year 2017. He is the lecturer at Thapathali Engineering Campus at Kathmandu. He is interested to carry out research in tribal socio-cultural lifestyles and its impact in rural sustainability through the study of their diverse traditions. Being a scholar from ethnic minority, he has a keen interest to promote tribal cultural values. 
since much less has been written on Nepal's Tharu community, his future research concerns over the construction of dynamics of Tharu folk force. Now, without further delay, we shall start with today's session. Uh, Guru Sharon Lovin, I request you to please present your views on today's topic. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Namaskar. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, the subject of folkloric, I understand that you don't mean what is often called folk, but more traditional forms, um, because classical all evolves from folk. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so I take it as you mean traditional, uh, because of the many members comprised. So I'm going to be speaking about Chow. Now, Chow or Cho originated as an all male tradition, and it was performed primarily during the springtime Chait Parva as part of very elaborate rituals that preceded the dance performances. And these were in honor of Lord Bhairav and Surya. So we all know it has a great deal of martial vigor, but it is counterbalanced with very delicate, lasya, nuanced uh, movements. And they use Vedic as well as mythological themes. And they alternate between village and nature subjects. So if you start my slides, I'd like to have you watch something more interesting than just my mouth moving, a talking head. <clears throat> so these are the three best known forms of chow. On the left, you have the Perulia chow, typical mask. At the top, you have Hans, uh, the swan, actually Himalayan goose, in the Saraikala chow tradition. And at the bottom right, you have the unmasked Meyerbunch chow. Um, now, during British colonial rule, the princely states of Meyerbunch and Den Canal in what is uh, uh, considered Odisha, others nearby, Perulia in West Bengal, and Saraikala, which became part of Bihar and now is part of the state of Jharkhand. Um, initially, these Maharajas had their own private armies. And this was banned uh, in the 1800s uh, by the British. And so some states continued to maintain their pika or foot soldiers as dance troops. And they had the same vigorous exercises, um, but they were stylized into these themes that were set to music. Now, even the female Nachni in the rural areas and other folk traditions informed the development of Chow. So of the three major forms, okay, this is what I've, I've already said. Uh, and here you have an example of what would be pika transformed into dance. And here another. So um, the basic stance is holding a sword and a shield. Um, although it's only used for certain, certain compositions. And the term chow has various interpretations for what it may mean. Chaya, which would be shadow, the image of the mask, or the Sanskrit root, the chadma, disguise, and in Odia Chani, military camp, the armor or the stealth. So of the three major chow forms that are being performed today, both Perulia Chow and Saraikala are performed with masks. The Meyerbunch Chow from Northern Odisha is performed without masks. And because of not having the masks, which also limit your visibility and, and your breathing, uh, it facilitates more articulated torso movements. So there's a lot more torso movement, um, something like what we see sometimes in Odissi or Gojipur dance. So here is, is what they connect. If you look at the Meyerbunge, it developed under royal patronage in Odisha, and it has a very sophisticated movement vocabulary. In Saraikala, um, there were royal dancers, members of the royal family, who were choreographers and performers, so it crossed mm -hmm. caste boundaries. You had oil pressers dancing, as well as um, 
uh, royal dancers. And uh, it also has a very sophisticated movement vocabulary, and it's now in Jharkhand. Purulia in West Bengal is also, of course, masked. And uh, it is the most acrobatic and dynamic, where you do um, somersaults landing on your knees and a lot of very vigorous movement. Uh, it had less royal patronage, and so, um, uh, and so most of the performers were really the, um, uh, the rural uh, farming community. Den Canal, also in Odessa, was also a masked form. And they all evolved from these Pika martial arts traditions and traditionally performed by men. So here's an example of Meyer Bunch Chow. Um, it used, I mean, the reason I began learning it was because there was a great guru, Guru Krishna Chandra Nayak, who had come to Delhi when he got Sangeet Natak Academy Award. And it demanded the same uh, flexibility, control, um, and strength um, of 17 years of ballet and modern dance. So when it flourished, there were very strictly supervised opposing teams, the Uttar Sahi and the Dakin Sahi. And the best new choreography of either new or established themes was rewarded when it was presented to the Maharaja during the spring Chaitupava festival. So that means that the same subject of a dance like Mahadevi, uh, Dandi, and Radhakrishna, all of these things uh, might be presented every year, but they would be done with new choreography, which would be practiced in secret from the other team so that hopefully that they would win. Uh, this is a photo of the uh, of some major gurus. Uh, in the lower right, you have uh, Madan Mohan Lenka, uh, Krishna Chandra Nayak, my guru, and the the junior of them, uh, Sri Hari Nayak. So, at the time of independence, as you know, the royals were all given privy purses, which were soon taken away. Because of that, the patronage could not be continued. The Maharaja, knowing that the, knowing that the style would now not maintain the same standards, he forbade the dancers to perform. But fortunately, uh, my guru, who was young, he had um, he had left because he had uh, done some infraction and been told not to perform one year. So he had gone to Calcutta, where he began in Calcutta. Uh, to start to teach young women who wanted to learn Chow. And then he joined the Little Ballet Troupe, uh, which was a remarkable uh, performance group in Gwalior. Um, um, and there he used Chow to uh, expand the repertoire, both for ballets, for traditional pieces. And so his very Lassia and feminine Chow choreography also exemplified this kind of Najni, Gautapuri, uh, Odissi evolution along the same spectrum. These are the uh, instruments that are used in Chow. And uh, that's my daughter when she was a kid. And um, most of the performances with the music, uh, they will also use Shanai traditionally we'll be using audio songs that are well known. So while the songs are not sung during the performance, the audience will know the songs uh, that are being performed. But because of the setting and the open air and the crowds, and before there was really um, microphones and sound systems, so the songs weren't sung even though everyone was familiar with them. Now this is the Saraikala Chow Guru, very famous. Uh, Guru Kedranath Sahu, and uh, this is a Mayur pose, Mayur the peacock. And this is uh, Mayur in costume. Now, because of the royal patronage in Saraikela, they could afford to have more elaborate costumes. And so you have the um, Banaras silk saris and organzas that are used in these. And also because the Saraikala troupe had performed throughout Europe um, in the 30s, um, pre-World War II, uh, so, and the influence of seeing 
other kinds of arts, uh, most likely also Indonesian, as well as things done by Uday Shankar and others, you have a very sophisticated kind of mask usage in Surakula. This is a, another of uh, Mayur, the peacock. And this is uh, a Vedic theme, Ratri, the night, with the, uh, with the moon. Now, one thing that was interesting is that the choreographies that were done by the royal family um, had access to these themes and they were very sophisticated and very elegant, poetic, something like Sagar the sea, the sea was a metaphor of the poet who's floundering in life. And yet there were other dances that actually the royal family could not and did not perform, uh, which were more vigorous, that were performed by uh, traditional artists who were part of the troops. Now, this is a production that I had done for uh, Durdarshan and Kamani. Because it's considered a folk form, it would never have been included in a national program of dance. And fortunately, once I was asked uh, what I would like to do for national program of dance, I decided to do chow. And this was created and presented at Kamani, where I took different solos and duets and combined them. So this is from the themes of nature. So you have uh, the bumblebee, uh, as well as the uh, other things from nature. And then there was the next one on man, which had things like the boatman and the hunters. And then you had the land of the gods. Now this is the typical masks of Seraykela. And you'll see the difference between these and the Purulia Chow masks. This is Purulia. So you can see uh, the difference. Elaborate headdress, uh, lots of feathers and tinsel. Uh, so here in the center is the um, Sirikula mask. And then on the right and the left, you have Davies with, um, uh, from, from Purulia. They're all made on a clay mold with then uh, paper mache and slip on top, clay slip to give a smooth surface. This is a photo in 1973 of the masks that I had bought in Shantanikitan in West Bengal at the Pushmela because the mask maker on the right had come from Purulia hoping that there would be some people at the Pushmela who'd like to buy them and I basically bought all of them. Uh, and this is just a typical photograph of, of the Purulia Chow. Um, okay, you can you can stop the slides and go back. Um, so, the, as I said, the Chow items, especially the Lassia ones, were set to the tunes of well-known Oriya folk songs, and that shows the direct sister, brother, cousin relationship that they have between Chow and Odissi. If you look at the basic stance of Odissi with its triple bend, when you take in Chow and you simply widen the stance slightly, broaden the shoulders, you have your basic pose, your Dharan. So the connection of the kind of aesthetics uh, of Odissa are there. Um, now, in, in slight connections of the traditions in Odisha, so as you know, the Godipura dance, one boy, these were dances performed by boys dressed as women uh, during the Bhakti movement, where they performed dances in public to Oriya songs, uh, Oriya devotional songs, whereas in the temple, the Maharis were dancing on the Gita Govinda uh, and singing those songs. Um, so Chow is, is kind of on a developmental range. So for instance, if you take a certain song, Ajamu, which could be done by a Gotipura, it is also done in Chow. So these things kind of flow uh, between the different things. 
Now, the movement of the torso is the most distinctive feature in Odyssey, and that graceful shifting is also seen very much in the chow. Um, and um, skip that. Uh, the music used in chow, Gotipur and Odyssey, it kind of stands at the crossroads between Hindustani, North Indian music, and the Carnatic South Indian music. So there's a strong regional identity and Odia scholars and musicians have been making efforts for uh, the music of uh, Odisha to be recognized as classical. And uh, there's acceptance in some circles, skepticism in others. So the verdict is still out on that. And um, um, I think that really the, the work that I know that my guru had done had brought it to a new level. At present, their support for, uh, for Chow training, there needs to be more support for choreography because uh, during its heyday of patronage, there was constant new choreography being done uh, to keep it going. So I think I'll end what I have to say now about Chow and then maybe take up more things during the question period. Thank you. That was a wonderful and a very detailed presentation, uh, Guru Sharon Logan, and uh, especially like the way you consolidated your real life experience into the presentation. I think it really added value to it. And uh, since I'm from West Bengal as well, I feel that I'm like much closer to my culture now, especially with everything that you said about Chow. Thank you so much. And uh, now I would uh, welcome our next speaker, uh, Dr. Andrew Alter. Uh, so the stage is yours now. Thank you very much. Um, I will share my screen. I just have a few slides to... Uh... I'm just getting there, so I'll be there shortly. Ah, I have a message. Chrome has lost permission to capture your screen. Just give me a few seconds, I'll make it work. I might have to just abandon that. I'll just see. Okay, so it doesn't look like you'll be able to see my slides. <laughs> Apologies for that. You'll just have to hear my voice since you can't uh, see those slides. I might try once more. No, sorry, it won't work. Okay. Um, I'll introduce myself uh, beyond uh, what uh, Shramana had uh, mentioned earlier on as somebody who's uh, done research into music of Uttarakhand and particularly in the area of looking at how epic performances are uh, presented in different ritual circumstances. Also looking at how drumming and dancing is associated with those performance styles and things. In particular, I've been uh, working most recently on uh, analyzing and documenting aspects of Pandav Lila, which is the uh, local Garwali uh, presentation of Mahabharat stories. Uh, at the village level, 
as well as with uh, local folk epics or what are referred to as lok gathas uh, that are performed by individual musicians, usually with a flavor that's uh, more uh, localized in, in a number of senses. Now, the Pandav Lila, which uh, many people are not aware of outside of Uttarakhand, maybe some of you watching now have been familiar with it. The Pandav Lila is, in fact, a village level performance as well as a ritual in which the Rajputs of the village will sponsor an event and uh, announce it many months ahead to invite family members to return to the village and to witness the performance of the Pandav Leela episodes uh, as it's performed over maybe two or three weeks in, in the village that it's sponsored at. Different Rajputs will take on characters from the Mahabharat, and so you have all of the main characters portrayed by local personalities and of course you have krishna you have arjun all five of the pandavas uh, you also of course have uh, subhadra and uh, all, all of the performers uh, will take on uh, will, will be taken on by various village uh, level performers each performance is uh, started usually in the afternoon uh, at around 2 p.m. and it lasts for two two hours with all of the uh, male villagers, largely the Rajputs, coming together and dancing in a circle formation as they go around the central stage. And then individual dancers will do an individual dance that portrays the character of their particular uh, person who they are portraying. So. Uh, for instance, Arjun and uh, uh, Draupadi will dance together uh, to demonstrate some aspect of their character. Or Bhim and Hanuman might actually dance together to demonstrate an argument that they had at some point during the story. Uh, as the process goes on, there's about a two-hour event in the afternoon, and everyone takes a break. And then in the evening, uh, Everybody comes back to the main uh, platform, the main stage at the village, and performs again. Maybe the same episodes, maybe different ones, depending on how it goes. Over two weeks, the performance becomes more and more elaborate, and as it becomes more elaborate, costumes become more elaborate, and so the festival itself is more like a progressive ritual in which these uh, uh, costumes and dance sequences um, become more elaborate to demonstrate various aspects of the person's uh, character as they dance it. Um, the, usually these performances climax in a final performance, maybe at the end of two weeks, uh, often which is portraying some special part of the Mahabharata itself. Um, not necessarily the last scenes from the actual Mahabharata or what we understand to be the Mahabharata in various traditions, uh, but usually something that's more dramatic for the purposes of uh, entertaining the larger crowds that are, that are attracted by the end of these things. And so one of the most famous scenes that's often showed at the end these days is the Chakravyuha Chakra state uh, performance, where, of course, Abhimanyu, Arjun's son, arrives on his rat, and he is uh, he, he battles his way through six doors into the middle of the maze uh, before he is finally uh, killed by the Kauravs at the end. And so this is a very emotional scene that usually is used to end those performances. In a nutshell, those are the uh, the way that Pandav Leela is performed in Garhwal. It's episodic in that it's portrayed over two weeks as well as twice in each day. And so each scene really is an episode within the whole story, but the actual plot line of uh, story enveloping, uh, uh, happening in a sequence that is understood is not necessarily always the point of the performance. 
things will jump back and forth from the story to earlier parts of the story and back, depending on what particular per performers want to portray. And in that sense, the whole thing is really a series of episodes. And sometimes they're referred to not as Pandavlila or even Mahabharat. Mahabharat is very uh, irregularly used as a term to refer to it. They're more used, uh, referred to in relation to the actual episode being performed. So uh, they might have a reference to Gerda, and the Gerda is when uh, the rhinoceros is shot and killed uh, by uh, Arjun and others. And so the, it might be portrayed as Wampar Gerda Laga Rakhai, that he that, that's being portrayed in that village, not that it's a kind of Leela or a Mahabharata. In that sense, I think the episodic nature of how uh, Mahabharata is portrayed is clearly um, an essential aspect of how people understand the way that they need to perform it. In addition, I've also done some work on local folk epics that are not Mahabharata oriented, but are sung by individual singers who sing these tales. And they are referred to as folk epics um, by a number of authors, including, including a very well-known author, Govind Jatak, who's uh, per, uh, published the uh, Garwal Ke Lok Gathai. In those, there's a history of local performances, again, that is very episodic in nature. And so we often think of these epics as lengthy performances, when in reality, if you're actually watching the performance or listening to a singer who might be singing a tale, they will do it in a very structured way with breaks in between and with particular moments that even audience members might get up to dance and enjoy the performance before the story moves ahead after uh, a break in between for either a smoke or a cup of tea or something like that. And so I see these whole uh, performance traditions in Garwal as ways in which epics, whether they're folk epics sung by singers or whether they are Pandavlila type epics related to the classical tradition, all of them are, of course, portrayed in a performance sense very much along the lines of a, a, a serialized system of episodes uh, that, that have more meaning as themselves and for the characters in it. Um, I'll leave it at that, and obviously I'll be able to uh, answer questions later on in the question and answer uh, series. Thank you. was a wonderful talk, sir. And uh, I would, like, as far as I know, that Ramdila is something that is more prevalent uh, in uh, in concern with the Indian uh, tradition. And thank you so much for introducing us to uh, Pandavila. Hmm. So uh, I would uh, ask our next speaker, Dr. Arjun Raina, uh, to please uh, talk about uh, your <coughs> ideas and your views on this topic. Over to you, sir. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm at a, I'm sitting back a bit, but all right. Thank you. Yes, and and thank you, Andrew, for referring to the Mahabharat Arjun as Arjun, and not Arjuna and Mahabharata and Bhima. Um, it's it's very it's very nice to hear, you know. Uh, except for the Ganda, it was good that the Ganda had a R behind it. But <laughs> and um, I, I I laugh about this, but this is the essence of textuality, you know, text and textuality, because in in text and text we are speaking to somebody behind our shoulder in a language and an accent that they understand it, you know, and I'm going to be at a slight tangent to this topic, um, only because that's that's how I'm coming to it coming to the idea of folk and folklore. I come from a performer, performer training world, you know? So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to comment in some ways around a performance, performer training from, from that angle. <clears throat> and I, I want you to think of the shift that is, in, is, is happening between the a very important shift between text and textuality 
and into embodiment where where the body is being used as a tool of inquiry, uh, moving away from uh, the business of the mind and ideas being wrapped in language and being and and the and the interweave of language and mind and ideas as different to that the body and the body being used as the centerpiece to find new knowledge or find an insight so my main argument is that when as different to text and textuality you use the body as the tool of inquiry you get a more stable understanding of the difference between all these different performances uh, traditions the folk the indigenous tribal ritual and classical performances all right that's a little point of intervention that i'm offering this primary difference between text and textuality and the body and embodiment is reflected in the role assigned even to the text the main text the ma text the nata shastra and its relationship to my performance tradition um, which is kathakali which is a embodied practitioner tradition western academics like uh, Phil, the late philip uh, zarelli uh, working with the a self-confessed Cartesian mind-body uh, split, where the mind is in a way considered uh, superior to the body, the mind is reading the actions of the body, place the text over the body in some ways in which, in the same way as the Natya Shastra has been placed right at the apex. It's, these are all brilliant works. They, they, are, I, they are way beyond me to comment, but it's the hierarchy that I am Re uh, referencing that for, that is a result of text and textuality, the reflex to hierarch hierarchize. I use the knowledge available from an embodied traditional practitioner like Balakrishnan to re reference Zarelli's scholarship on the role of the Nati Shastra. Both Zarelli and Balakrishnan begin this thesis on Kathakali by identifying its sources and attempting to put it into a historic context Significantly, their first difference is on one of the assumed primarily textual source of Kathakali, the Nata Shastra. While Zareli aligns and connects Kathakali along a straight historical line that emerges from the Nata Shastra in the second century AD, reaching Kathakali via the classical form Kudiyatam, Balakrishnan, Sadhanam Balakrishnan, a great guru of Kathakali, also my guru, uh, articulates a need to distance Kathakali from it. For instance, the founders of Kathakali had a wealth of local dramatic examples from which to draw upon and hence have bypassed many of the tenets of the Nati Shastra, the most important Sanskrit treatise on Indian theatre. Balakrishnan's need to define and, uh, and distance Kathakali's relationship with the Nati Shastra make him drive the argument further. In fact, the similarities that do exist between Bharat Muni's treatise and, the, and Kathakali are fewer than expected and possibly incidental. So this tension between text and body, where over the, over the last thousand years, text has dominated. Um, when, you, when you look from the practitioner's point of view, the body has something else to say, something different to say, and that is what I'm listening to. Balakrishnan struggles with the Natya Shastra relevant as they reveal local, regional, internal schisms and stresses within the nation state. Since independence in India in 1947, an overriding national agenda has meant the recognition and celebration of iconic texts like the Nati Shastra as part of the pan-Indian national identity. At times, this national identity is perceived to dominate the local Balakrishnan and embodied practitioner responding to his local Kerala roots and identity while resisting an obligatory acknowledgement of the Nati Shastra as a primary source of the classical arts, including Kathakali, suggests that the sources of Kathakali lie more practically within the embodied practices of indigenous folk, ritual, tribal, and classical performing traditions of Kerala, including, and he names all of the following, in addition to Tayyam, Muriyattu, and Kalari Pite, Podakalli, Kaikotikalli, Kolkalli, Pandam Kalli, Margam Kalli, Kanair Kalli, Mangalam Kalli, Velakalli, Pavakuda, Chakyar Kuda, Kalam Tulal, Otan Tulal, Patiani, Kota Mori, Arjunan Nittam, and Tala Pava Kuda. 
Zarelli, on the other hand, while acknowledging the maze of performance tradition sources in Kerala, does not choose to name or engage with them in great detail. Instead, hierarchizes the classical, defining it as aesthetically the most refined. The classical performance tradition is the most aesthetically refined of these performance spheres. So this uh, this hierarchizing is a is a textual reflex, and uh, I want to, for brevity of time, um, basically. Uh, I am, you know, it's like in in as an actor. So I'm a I'm a contemporary actor also. I'm a Kathakali actor, also. I also chant. I sing, and people say, which do you prefer? Do you prefer acting or Kathakali or singing? But you do everything, and this is all of them are you. You know, as a performer, in the same way as uh, it's very difficult. If you asked from the body of Sadhanam Balakrishnan to say. What is a folk action? What is a folk gesture? What is a classical gesture? And what is a ritual moment of ritual? Performers will find it very difficult to separate this, right? So that is the nature of the embodiment process. So I'd like to just uh, give you a, a, a little glimpse of my reading, my understanding of uh, tayyam using just the head, just the idea of the head, and as the tool and the link between uh, Tayyam, Kudiyattam, and Kathakali, which one is wrongly interpreted, Kudiyattam as a ritualistic perform, the other as Tayyam as folk, and Kathakali as classical. And of course, they may all be that if the scholar does say they are. So this is Balakrishnan describing the performer actor, Tayyam actor, transformation into a deity god. After the final touches to the makeup, usually the application of lip color, the dancer looks into the handheld mirror handed to him by his assistants. The magnificent colossal form of the deity is reflected. The deity has become manifest in the performer. The dancer plucks flowers from the wristlets or headdress, offers them to the deity reflected in the mirror. Instantly he falls into a trance and the dance of the tayyam begins. What can be more refined and sophisticated than the ability to enter into a trance, to be instantaneously transformed into the other, to become a god for a day, to play, dance, move, speak and behave like a god without error, perfectly, and the return from this possessed state? How does that happen? Balakrishnan explains it is believed that the actor who takes the role of Kali becomes so entranced that he may indeed kill Darika if not stopped by the removal of her headgear, the muri. Here is the critical element of the body in performance, the head and the headdress, the muri or the kiridam, as it is called in Kathakali. With its removal, the trance ends. Both the wearing off and taking off of the headdress are important events at the start and end of the trance position performance state. The headdress forces a significant balance to the head, preventing the performer from losing his head as he goes deeper into the trance performance. The kiridam helps facilitate this performance state. Very few Western performers have ever danced Kathakali with a kiridam. It is my experience that a balanced head is the precondition for the flow of emotions, for the bhav or embodied emotion to be experienced by the actor. It is this balanced head and body that becomes a vessel to be filled with emotion. Thus, the wearing of the kiridam is critical to the performer's own and the audience's experience of aesthetic pleasure or us. This wearing of a kiridam or some form of elaborate headdress crown is common to all three forms, kudiyatam, kathakali, and tayyam, making all three equally sophisticated modes of performance. That's my very simplistic uh, political point. All three are equal modes. Of course, the, it's left to the wisdom of each scholar to decide and make a difference between one and the other. Right, thank you. Is there? Oh. Thank you so much for this uh, enriching talk, sir. Especially like uh, what you said that uh, how body is used as a tool for inquiry. Uh, like I had never looked at uh, performance and performative act as something adhering to the body. Like generally people look at the culture and the tradition attached. And uh, especially what you said about uh, mind being superior to the body, I feel that this has always been uh, spoken, especially during the 
uh, enlightenment heroes like Rene Descartes has always said that I think, therefore I am. The mind always been like more superior to the body. And thank you so much for uh, drawing this binary of mind and body. Uh, like especially of how you uh, concluded saying that the balanced head, how it leads uh, to the emotions that is like shown by the body. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, and uh, now I would welcome our uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Umesh Batra. Uh, so please enlighten us with your views on the topic. Uh, over to you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shramana, and uh, I thank the entire uh, team of Tell Me Your Story for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I must acknowledge before entering into my topic that I'll be most benefited by this talk uh, because unlike all the other panelists who are not only scholars, but also adept practitioners of their art, I'm just a researcher. So I'm really proud of uh, being part of this panel. Uh, so I'll be talking about Odia Pala Theatre, and uh, I think uh, uh, Guru uh, uh, Sharon will agree with me when I say that uh, uh, it's difficult, if not impossible, to understand the Odia culture without getting a grasp of the Jagannath culture, the culture of Jagannath. That's there with Odissi, that's there with Pala as well. So I'll be keeping uh, Jagannath in, my, uh, in the back of my mind while referring to Pala. So what is Pala? Pala is a kind of folk theatrical performance which combines the element of dance, drama, music, and oratory. There are usually uh, five to six performers on the stage, and uh, Pala is performed for four to six hours, usually in the night time. The competitions, which are called Badi Pala, and uh, apart from that, the popular form of Pala that is there in Odisha today is Tia Pala, which is normally regarded as Pala. And uh, the topics in Pala or the narratives in Pala are mostly mythological. They may come from Ramayana, Mahabharata, uh, or the local Puranas, the Odia Puranas. They may be legendary. They may refer to any Odia devotee of Jagannath, or they may be purely historical as well. Now, what differentiates Pala from other form of uh, mimetic art is that there is this frequent use of Rasabhanga, which I call the dissolution of Rasa. For example, in case the troop takes up one particular particular story, uh, let's say that is the story of Raja Harishchandra and while they are describing that story, the performers are also enacting different portions, different characters in that play. So the lead singer, which, who is called Gayak, will become Harishchandra. The Sripalya, the comedian or the Bidushak, he will uh, become, uh, become Sabya, the wife of Harishchandra and the other singers will become other minor characters, maybe somebody will become Vishwamitra, so on and so forth. So let's imagine that uh, this is the most important scene where Harish Chandra is about to sell his wife and his child in order to pay the Dakshina to sage Vishwamitra. It's a very pathetic uh, scene and Harish Chandra is asking Sabya, his wife, Sabya, what is your last wish from your husband now that I'm going to sell you to the highest bidder? At that time, Sabya, enacted by a male palya, by a male performer, trying to speak in an effeminate voice will say that uh, Swami, can I get some dahi bada from this place? Because I've heard that they are awesome, they are delicious. Now this particular shift in the tone of the play, in the tone of the narration brings us from the spiritual, mythological realm in which people accepted Harishchandra's plight and they were experiencing Karuna Rasa straight down into their mundane reality, in their contemporaneous reality, to their uh, to, 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 to the place where the Palla is being performed. And it evokes laughter. It is called Rasavanga. Palla is also criticized for it, but I believe that this is one of the most beautiful elements of Palla because it creates a shift between the world that they are showing and the world the audience are watching the Palla uh, directly in. And that can be compared to the technique of alienation in which Bertolt Brecht wanted to differentiate his actors from the characters. He wanted the audience to know that what they are watching are just people enacting a particular play. They are not suffering themselves and people should get agitated by that. People should know that the real suffering is suffered by the audience members, not by the actors, not by the characters. And then that agitation should lead them for some kind of political protest. And that, you know, in technical terms, that can be compared with Pala, though in terms of content, there are a lot of differences. 
so i will be talking about uh, the stories beautiful stories regarding the origin of pala and uh, one of the stories that uh, professor hiren das who is a scholar on pala uh, has stated is that pala has been derived from the word pali pala has been derived from the buddhist tradition of odisha Uh, buddhism had a tremendous influence of odisha and uh, it is believed that two of the famous first disciples of buddha named tapasu and vallik were kalinga tradesmen kalinga was the ancient kalinga was the ancient name of odisha and when ashoka uh, when ashok i am sorry uh, invaded kalinga at that time he transformed himself into a very non violent king and he uh, made odisha a completely buddhist state and it is believed that the elucidation of the subtle philosophy within the pali canon was the task of the pala singers to do in the vernacular language in which the masses would understand and morris winternight when he distinguishes pali as a literary language he says that pali is the language of the canon it is not a language that was in use before the canons were written it was the language in which abhidhamma pitak sutta pitak and vinaya pitak were written that's why pala is associated with buddhism according to one theory and that also associates jagannath because it is believed that jagannath is a traditional buddhist deity and the sacred object that is within that wooden idol of jagannath is actually the sacred tooth relic of buddha himself another story combines pala uh, associates pala with the later existing traditions in odisha in a sanskrit verse named gane ambike rudre narayane bhaskare tatha together they were called panchali or the combination of five uh, five it is believed that pala came from panchali so those who were the followers of ganesh those were the followers of narayan or the vaishnav those were the followers of ambika or shakta those were the followers of rudra or shaiva and those were the followers of bhaskar or the sun god the saurav they had a dominance in odisha so in the later time pala performed pala was a kind of performative tribute to the combination of all these five sects who were embodied or deified in one god one deity named satyanarayan so the presiding deity of pala is regarded as satyanarayan and satyanarayan is also regarded as an incarnation of jagannath so that is how pala is again related to jagannath the third and most interesting story about pala is that pala came at a juncture when hindu and islamic faith were at confrontation at logger heads in odisha and that situates pala to the 17th century according to this theory uh, it's believed that the jagannath prasad which is called abadha not served it is not served to people the people are supposed to take it directly from your hands it was a ploy to remove untouchability so it is believed that at one particular congregation a number of devotees of jagannath offered the sacred food to the abadha to their muslim friends and they said pao meaning receive and the muslim said lao meaning bring it the frequent utterance of this pao and lao pao and lao led to the coinage of the word pala so pala is regarded as a syncretic performance that combines the elements of hinduism and islam and this was also reflected in the changing of the name of the presiding deity of pala who was earlier satyanarayan the combination of the five sects later became satyapir so the hindu god satyanarayan and the muslim uh, fakir peer combined came together and led to the creation of a hybrid deity a deity that embodies both the values of hinduism and islam and that is why the first text the first palas that were written the first narratives that were performed in pala that were written also used a language that was a combination of both odia hindi parsi bengali and it was a poet named kavi karna who wrote the story of the birth of satyapir and, and that story is also associated with the birth of jagannath the story is also associated with the story of krishna today uh, i could uh, you know tell a lot about the islam make and hindu influences on pala but today pala is used not necessarily as a religious not necessarily as a religious uh, as, a, as a ritualistic performance it is also it has also added secular elements into it for example for the uh, awareness regarding polio for the awareness regarding aids some pala troops go to, from village to village and they talk about they talk to people about preventive measures so pala is a kind of folk art which has assimilated various traditions that flourished at different times in odisha and i hope that it continues to flourish 
i'll just uh, end my talk by uh, reciting one particular line uh, from a famous pala text uh, written by kabhi karna who says that um, अलेखेर महिमा के बोलते पारी तुर्क तके खोदा बोले हिंदू बोले हरी हु कैन डेस्क्राइब द ग्लोरी ऑफ अलेख दैट व्हिच कैन नॉट बी डेस्क्राइब्ड द तुर्क कॉल्स हिम खुदा एंड हिंदू कॉल्स हिम हरी एंड देयरफॉर पाला एट अ टाइम ऑफ कन्फ्रंटेशन बिकेम अ पैनेसिया टू इफ नॉट एंड देन एटलीस्ट एसोसिएट द कॉन्फ्लिक्ट बिटवीन वेरिंग फेथ्स एंड कंपीटिंग फेथ्स थैंक यू thank you sir for this wonderful talk and uh, i really like the three different origin stories that you uh, told us about uh, pala you not only brought in uh, the mythological origin uh, but you uh, talked to us about the buddhist and as well as the uh, commingling of the hinduism and islamic tradition uh, both like resulting uh, into this pala tradition thank you so much Uh, and now we uh, move on to our last speaker professor mohan danzaura uh, sir please the stage is yours so thank you sramana ji now again uh, good evening to everyone uh, uh, let's start uh, from my basic introduction uh, so i am only a speaker from nepal so i guess and since uh, i am interested to conduct research in uh, thar tribe of nepal i hope uh, many of us here may not be aware about who are tharus so uh, since uh, our the motto of our program is tell me your story so i will just narrate the basics of uh, the community today okay so if we uh, talk about like tharu community of nepal uh, then so tharu community of nepal they are tribals uh, who basically are residents of tarai area of nepal and if we see the geography of nepal then nepal is divided into three geographical regions like uh, so tarai area and hilly and mountain region and if we talk about uh, tharu uh, uh, tribals then uh, uh, the history of tharu tribals of course it goes back to uh, like indian history as well so tharu tribes they not only reside uh, only inside in nepal uh, so they are like scattered community and who uh, so live uh, around the borders of india and nepal uh, basically to my research when i like started conducting or uh, how i uh, showed my interest in conducting research uh, in my or for my own community uh, as far as i remember like uh, so once i oh, so was in interview and one of my professor actually when we were discussing about like research ethics and all of these things my professor he came to ask me like since you belong to tharu community one of the, like rich indigenous community of nepal why don't you uh, do research in folklore or performance of your own community instead of like going for the novels uh, european novels or uh, like american novels and instead of uh showing interest in their culture or in their performance or in their narratives uh, it would be better if you go uh, uh, so to your own community and if you uh, like do research for your own community and that was the moment actually that triggered me uh, because if we talk about uh, research uh, conducted in tharu communities or any of the indigenous communities of nepal uh, there uh, have been researches but th those researches actually they uh are not able to have that kind of intellectual impact a kind of a discussion among intellectuals if we talk about any of the uh, like indigenous community of nepal uh, and uh, talking about like tharu indigenous of nepal uh, since uh, tharu indigeneity is uh, the fourth largest indigeneity of nepal uh, so i thought that it would be better to do research uh, within my community uh, because uh, uh i will be able to bring a kind of authentic discourses uh so i thought uh, and i decided to choose uh, my own committee for the research and when i started like conducting research about tharu community of nepal uh, since i am like a scholar or whatever a uh, student of a literature of english uh, i decided uh, uh, because of my study 
I actually connected performance with a kind of agency marker, uh, performance with kind of identity, uh, because of the too much readings of discourses of Foucault and then uh, other, like, let's say, liberals are Marxist or socialist. And that was a moment like I decided I should rather connect the performance or folklore uh, with the kind of agency uh, of the community. And if we talk about uh, like history of Tharu community in Nepal and Dangaura Tharus of Nepal, then Dangaura Tharus of Nepal, uh, they like basically uh, live in six districts, uh, Tarai districts of Nepal, uh, Dang, uh, Kailali, Kanchanpur, Banke, Bardia, and uh, Chitwan. So now if we talk about their history, then uh, basically they, they have a history of uh, like a displacement and longing for their native place. Because if we go through their history, then uh, in the past, they used to reside inside the Dang Valley. And that Dang Valley is nowadays uh, inside the Dang district of Nepal. And again, when I was actually like uh, going through the reviews and literature reviews and all of these things, and uh, when I wanted to actually trace the uh, like very uh, genuine place of Dangara Tharu, I came to know that there is a place called Dang in Gujarat state as well. And then uh, there also in that place, uh, like at, uh, so tribal people live and it fascinated me actually. So uh, I was more excited to know more about the Tharus of Nepal. And uh, because if we talk about Tharu community, then uh, from the name itself, uh, there are like popular uh, discourses or rumors. Uh, that Tharus, they come from Thar Desert of India. Uh, since uh, they come from the Thar Desert, then they have the surname like Tharus, uh, and they can like be a, a, a kind of a heat of Tarai region. So that's how there is also a kind of popular uh, belief uh, behind the surname of Tharus. And if we talk about like Dangaura Tharus, then uh, as, as I was talking, like they migrated from the inner valley of Dang districts of Nepal, and then they again scattered, or they again uh, so migrated towards uh, like western Thai districts of Nepal up to Kanchanpur. So if we like uh, bring image inside our mind where these Kailali Kanchanpur districts of Nepal lie, then so they lie around Uttar Pradesh and then Uttarakhand. So these districts are. Uh, uh, like connected with Uttra, Uttar Pradesh and Uttarakhand. So Tharus not only live inside Nepal, they also live in India. Uh, but if, uh, then if we talk about like uh, folk performance of the community, then folk performance of the community, uh, like they are the uh, reflection of their whole way of life. Because if we talk about their performance, then their performance start from the uh, very beginning of the year. Uh, and in Nepal, like we generally have a practice of uh, uh, executing our official job or other sort of work based on Bikram Sambad at BS, uh, unlike in India, which is in uh, we uh, in in AD. So uh, Tharus uh, like every their rituals uh, and then festivals, the all their rituals and festivals uh, they like uh, reflect they are very innocent and uh, a kind of uh, agrarian life. And if we talk about uh, rituals throughout the year, then uh, their rituals start from like Hariya Guriya. Hariya Guriya means when they first start uh, like uh, entering into the field uh, for like paddy sowing, then it's called Hariya Guriya. Then after uh, that, uh, they have like Gurhi. Gurhi means festival where they like uh, chase the dragonfly. And they, uh, so to chase that dragonfly, so that their crops will be safe, uh, they basically when they uh, cannot chase like a uh, real dragonflies uh, out in the environment, they make a kind of toy dragonflies, and uh, symbolically they like uh, beat those dragonflies, uh, toy dragonflies, and that uh, sim the meaning of that symbolic beating of those uh, dragonflies actually mean that their crops will be safe uh, from that insects. And after that, they celebrate Astimki. Astimki means Danmastami of Krishna. So Lord Krishna in Tharu community also, like they have their own version of Lord Krishna and they have their own version of Mahabharat. And uh, they have uh, their own version of Mahabharat is called Barki Mar or the big dance.
so uh, the book is also written by like Kurt Mayer and Pamela Duell. They are like French, uh, they are French authors. So Tharuj also have their own version of Mahabharat, where uh, actually the character of Bhishma is emphasized uh, than others. So after that, then uh, they have Atwari and today that Atwari day and Atwari is a kind of a celebration uh, where brothers, they have fasting uh, for the whole day. And then next day, like they go to their sister's uh, house uh, and then they carry whatever like dishes they have prepared the previous day. And then they uh, carry those dishes as the gift uh, to their sisters. And then, of course, uh, then comes the Sain, which is also the national festival of uh, Nepal. And uh, during the Sain, so Tharuj, especially Dangora Tharuj, they perform like Barki Mar. Barki, man, ba, Barki Mar means lyrical version of uh, Mahabharat in so in their own style. So uh, then they make group, and uh, especially the priests of uh, who are called Guruas in Tharu committee, they help, uh, the, uh, they help those performers to perform that great uh, dance uh, based on the story of Mahabharat. Uh, but the problem nowadays is the community because of uh, modernization and because of all of these things, urbanization and other sort of things, uh, the performance of such Barki Mars uh, uh, are very less nowadays. Uh, we only like and have the experience of such performance in very uh, few places, not like in all places where Tharu's leave, the Barki Mar is performed during the same. And then every Tharu uh, like uh, uh, individual can have that experience of very authentic kind of uh, narration or culture. Uh, so then uh, after that uh, Tharu during the same, they like perform different dances like Sakya, Maina and Chokra. And then Mag, Mark comes, Mark means generally, so it falls uh, in the month of like January. And Maggi is national festival of Tharuj. And during that time also, they uh, like sing a song or they perform a song which is uh, called Dhamar. And during that time also, they sing songs based on Lord Krishna. So after that, uh, they have also ritual of performing uh, uh, like songs during uh, the farewell of uh, bride when a bride leaves her home uh, so there is a kind of uh, singing by the women of that community and they uh, so bid farewell to that uh, uh, newly uh, wedded or uh, newly wed uh, so bride and finally this is how every performance or rituals of tharu community somehow uh, they are not so much uh, complex in their philosophy but uh, they reflect their uh, very simple way of life, uh, really uh, connected. They are uh, connected to agri agriculture, uh, connected to farming, and connected to nature of their pagan gods. Uh, but the movements, and if we talk about uh, uh, details of their performance and performers, of course, during uh, the performance of their rituals and songs and dances, uh, they have their own unique dress, and then they have their own like. Uh, style of intonating the songs and lyrics and they have uh, their own musical instruments as well if we talk about uh, like dress of uh, women in mean of tharu community and basically the dress of uh, women uh, seems to be inspired from uh, like with women's dress of rajasthani uh, uh, community because uh, tharu women they also wear lehenga uh, which is quite similar, which looks quite similar to the dress of uh, Rajasthani women. And then Tharu mean uh, their traditional attire is like they wear dhotis and then a white uh, short, and then they place gamchas on their uh, shoulder. So these are the things basically uh, about Tharu communities. And uh, if we talk about like, uh, as I was discussing, all the performances and rituals somehow they are based on their uh, like uh, agrarian way of life because from the past tharus were uh, people of uh, land uh, people of soil earth and and they remember like how they were connected and how they had been and they 
or like son if i'm not being like a, a, a kind of sexist uh, they have been or they are like sons of the earth so this is how in every of their ritual before their ritual and after their ritual they bring the reference of like harvesting the crops they bring the reference of good harvesting and they remember their pagan gods and they always pray to their gods to bless them with the good harvesting so uh, these are the things uh, which get reflected in their performance besides these uh, now they also talk about their past life if we talk about the tharu community then there is a specific uh, discourse that some of them were like uh, kamayas kamayas means workers uh, in others like land or in others house so in the past when tharu used to live in a kind of very uh, unenclosed uh, land and they were living a kind of very sing with a singular community their own members were there and after that uh, as the time grew and then as the hilly people of nepal and hima like mountain people uh, himalayan people they uh, started to migrate towards uh, tarai region uh, because life in hilly is very much difficult as they started to hilly and uh, privileged and literate people started to migrate towards the area of tharu and tharu people because of their illiteracy because of their like lack of political awareness and a kind of uh, that kind of as an a cunningness and smartness they could not uh, manage uh, they, they could not manage their own identity or agency and they came to lose their own kind of uh, uh, so power own sort of agency in their own uh, native land because hilly people they were privileged educated and literate they somehow like started to have uh, or started to possess uh, their property tharu people's properties or land so this is how when tharus in the past they actually realized that now so they should emigrate somewhere else uh, somewhere else from their own place so then they migrated from that inner valley of dang district and that uh, during that process uh, so of course they faced different difficulties and these sort of struggles and their difficulties and uh, challenges of uh, uh, so get, uh, getting uh, used to in a new place these all things are also reflected in their song called maina and uh, this process of exodus kind of thing where mass tharu they got displaced this is called buran 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 in their language so uh, this is how if we talk about like identity transformation or a kind of tharu subjectivity and conscience and then we uh, basically get like tharu subjectivity is uh, related with very uh, agrarian way of life because they are life in the past and still now most of the tharu uh, are farmers their life stories narratives rituals performance they are all related with uh, uh, agriculture and uh, a kind of very uh, serene way of life and another part of their rituals or performance is like how they reflect uh, by, like they uh, have been the victim of uh, suppression repression uh from the kind of privileged community so uh, this uh repression and then the need of agency and then the being vocal for uh, for their identity and agency uh, they these are the major uh, like uh, components of their performance uh, where they not only talk about uh, their way of life they also try to be assertive or they also try to assert their agency uh in the state uh so these are the things uh i i am sorry if i so i uh, took more time so this is it i think uh, we'll have much discussion later in as well thank you so much sir uh like as you uh said in the very beginning of your uh talk that uh we might not have a lot of idea about the uh, tharu community and thank you so much for acquainting us with this community across border so uh, 
now we shall uh, begin with our question answer session so my first question is to uh, guru sharon lowen uh, so um, ma'am um, the ways in which uh, chow is classified uh, it has um, altered as a result of changes in the region's geography ecological circumstances and the evolution of the many racial groups and the languages so is such a classification viable kindly elucidate on the various factors that lead to such a classification <clears throat> i'm sorry you mean classification in what way as folk or traditional or what uh ma'am in both folk and tradition and also with the various classifications that you mentioned uh that is the mayurbhanj and the sahitya uh, classification etc well you see classifications are always shifting um we have pigeonholed the multiple traditions of india into the western term of folk and classical and some people use the shastric term margi and deshi to mean deshi meaning folk and margi meaning classical i understand it a little differently deshi means entertainment and all forms of entertainment margi is those forms that are aiming for uh, evoking rasa and as you know when india became independent there were four forms recognized as classical it didn't mean they were the only forms um i think for instance in in kerala for various obvious reasons of a whole country they've given the name of classical to one art form whereas there are multiple forms equally deserving of the term classical which they are it just doesn't look good when some states have no so called classical form and others have uh and one state would have many as far as chow goes uh there was a conference i think it was uh in calcutta padatik shamananjalan organized it it was um in the 80s or the early 90s i forget and so i gave a presentation with my student and colleague gopal dube and so we were talking about chow so what i did was very simple i took a chow choreography and i said this is the pika movement this is how it became chow dance and this is what these movements are called if you use the sanskrit terms from shastra a very simple uh action so the scholars that were there i think maybe suresh avasti mohan koker sunil kotari two of them were there not all three i i can't remember they were so anxious to get my notes because it's like wow these are part of the terms that can then make a form recognized as classical at that time my feeling was it's a traditional art it doesn't need to be fit into this structure but i think that i made a mistake because because whether how you are classified has a great economic bearing on the artist so that when a chow dancer calls me up from suraj kun mela and says you know we're eating food that we can't eat we're wearing our costumes all day uh basically we're 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 considered tribal and and we're getting paid nothing so the classifications are very important but i think everybody here is well aware that the process of getting recognized as classical is a combination of uh or it used to be of sanskritizing getting recognized by certain individuals and institutions we have today at last count that i know eight classical styles um i think that a, a, that chow is perhaps as classical as one or two styles that have been recognized and definitely one that's in the waiting um i don't think it'll happen 
uh, anytime soon because it requires an NK Panikar or a, or a volatile or a Tagore or somebody at a certain level in the uh, to to make that happen. I mean, it's a very complicated whole issue, but. Um, you know, I mean, in Manipur, Laiha Robot wins every international folk competition because it's so sophisticated, but it's classified as folk, so it's there. Um, uh, in some ways, some of the standards of the art are going down, which brings it closer to a folk category in some of the things I see, but I also see quality. Um, I, I would say it's in the same category as Odyssey music. Um, uh, a case can be made, but do we have the people to make the case? I don't know if that answers your question. I, it's, it's complicated. And I'm not sure if, I mean, I, I used to feel it doesn't matter, but I think that um, in every way in terms of support, um, you know, the what even Dordrechen would pay to a folk artist compared to classical, compared to pop, uh, it matters where you are in the classification scale. As an art, it doesn't matter what genre you're doing, it's what are you communicating. Andrew. May I ask a follow-up question? Can I jump in and change the pattern? That Please. Sharon, may I ask, you, you mentioned in your slides once uh, a, a performance at Kamani Auditorium where uh, the dancers were labeled as actually classical um, because, well, of course, I think you said, well, they couldn't be referred to as folk because they wouldn't have been allowed on stage or something like that. I might be misrepresenting what you said. Um, is that in line with what you're talking about here in terms of... Um, okay, first of all, when I did that performance, okay, I had been speaking to somebody at ICCR, which I rarely do, and they said, and that whenever that was, they said, the problem with Indian dance going abroad is that it's all these little bits with descriptions, and it wasn't created in the kind of theatrical way that would work in the West. So I said, I will put together a program that's authentic chow, but it has these thematic things. So that's what I had done. When that performance was done at Kamani, there was an uproar from, from traditional artists who said, we have only been able to perform in front of tractors at the trade fair for the Tata group. We have never been given Kamani Auditorium. You gave it to her. And then after that, their status was raised and Chow now came on to the theatrical concert stage. Then that production, I was able to do at Dordershan. And at Dordershan, National Program of Dance was for classical dance. But because they had asked me, what kind of, what would you like to do? I was allowed personally to do a Chow production and another one on Ashok, um, which under the category of Chow, it was still not recognized as classical, but I was able to do it as a production. Thank you so much, ma'am, for answering the question. Uh, and now I would, uh, pose the next question to uh, Dr. Andrew Alter. So, um, so uh, folk and classical traditions engage with the Mahabharata epic in numerous ways. Similarly, uh, orality and literacy impact on the renditions of Pandav Lila and Uttarakhand in different ways. How have orality as well as other performative and written traditions of Mahabharata impacted on the episodic nature of Pandav Lila in Uttarakhand. Yes, thank you. This actually speaks very much to what Arjun was saying about uh, Kathakali and the text versus the embodied performance and things like that, because the, the, the stories 
when, when a dancer is dancing an episode from the Pandav Leela, uh, there are often moments when the drummers are not only playing, but reciting the story of what's going on in different ways. It may not be directly related to exactly what happens, and, and it changes according to the circumstance. But those are obviously memorized text that are not written down, but yet have some kind of a link uh, in people's minds to, of course, literate traditions of Mahabharat written down that exist somewhere in people's imagination. Well, not in imagination, they do exist, um, but are not used regularly by, certainly by the drummers who recite these stories or even uh, Rajput people who may recite some of these stories uh, because the whole tradition is, of course, an oral tradition. In that sense, um, there is, uh, you know, people are generally happy to refer to it as a folk tradition. And in fact, in, in the various ways that folk epics are classified in the literature by uh, authors like Chatak and Purohit and others like that, the, the tendency is to identify discrete stories and uh, identify them as folk tales or folk epics uh, because they are from an oral tradition. Yet when they're put into a literate form, uh, they, they do become somehow iconic for a presentation of folk arts within, <laughs> uh, within say, Uttarakhand, or uh, I'm sure it happens elsewhere as well. And so the dichotomy between literate and oral is uh, not, say, at the, at the level of the Shastric texts that are often referred to in terms of classical traditions like the Natya Shastra or whatever, but are uh, purely in terms of uh, these more recent uh, attempts by local literati to create particular uh, iconic versions of what should represent uh, uh, the examples of Mahabharata or Pandavila or some other uh, local story. Sir, for enlightening us with the, this orality and literary dichotomy. Uh, now, I would, uh, my next question is to Dr. Arjun Daina. So, uh, how does the politics and aesthetics of the worlds of Kathakadi looked at in terms of their traditional, folkloric, and classical development in contrast to the more contemporary and secular dynamics that are impacting Kathakali today? All right. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sh quite sure, even though you, I had, you had shared this question to me, but I'm still not quite sure how to answer it. But um, one can always give an on honest attempt. Um, if you just look at contemporary and secular, the, the second part of your question, if you look at those two words, contemporary, when Kathakali was created, it was created in the 16th, 17th century by Koteam Tamburan. And it, it, it was a contemporary creation, or it was a modern creation out of more uh, traditional and religious forms like Krishnatam and Ramanatam, the story of Krishna and Ram. So Kathakali was in, and for example, it was not over 40 nights, it was told over one night, all right? That was the big, it's like five-day cricket has become one-day cricket. So Kathakali has been contemporary in its spirit within its larger world for a long time. And if you understand that, that's how you can further contemporize Kathakali and make it into a two-hour or even in, you know, in a half an hour. If you get that sense of how Kotiam Tamburan first created a one-day uh, event, that's you can the same you can create a t20 kathakali with an equivalent uh, adherence to essential principles in the same way secular is a more pop problematic word today if you look at two elements of the secular one i've been thinking about this one the religious aspect which is a managing of the hindu muslim uh, situation and if you look at the other aspect of secular which means 
um, which means uh, not the Hindu Muslim, but beyond religion or, or keeping religion aside. So as I said, Kathakali, when it first was created, was secular in that context because it was the gods weren't an important element in it. The human epic characters were Arjun, Bhim, uh, Yudhishthir, and one of the gods who comes is Hanuman, who is you know is not a not a Aryan god in that sort of way. So it was moving away from Ram and Krishna to epic human characters, and that in that way it was secular. It was non-religious. As far as the Hindu Muslim, if that is the secularity you're, you're, you're referencing, then through Kerala, through Kerala's development, there have been all, so it, it in its original form, it was a Nair community. You know, it was not even beyond the Nair, it was the Nair community. The Tamburan, who is casteless in a way, created this form out of the Nair, Nairs. It's like Thakur's. In, in North India, it's a Thakur community, Nair warrior community. But over time in Kerala, it has become inclusive and all different uh, castes have, have, have been included, including Haider Ali, the great Muslim singer and others. So it is secular in that notion also. I think that that would be enough. Thank you so much, sir. Like what I uh, conclude from your uh, answer is that actually performances are an uh, like a mix of uh, secularism and um, the demography and everything that is like dictating uh, the performance of the contemporary age. Uh, thank you so much for your answer, sir. Uh, and my next question is to Dr. Umesh Patra. So uh, it is a common misconception that uh, folk drama which has its roots in village rituals, uh, lacks structure and adheres to no dramatic roots. So uh, do performances in Pala created have a plan and adhere to any mimetic rules? Uh, thank you. Uh, and it's a very uh, pertinent question. Uh, there are some rules in Pala, but these are to be understood within the context of Pala. So they have a structure. It's not a very rigid structure. They do have a structure. Uh, they have a Mangala Charan, which is also a kind of performance. They have Prasanga Praves and they have conclusion. So there are three segments. There is stylized dance and the musical renditions are also performed according to either some classical ragas or some contemporary uh, music, either from Bollywood or from albums. But that aside, that requires rigorous training on the part of uh, the performers. But that aside, I understand the assumption behind this question. And I would say that the uh, structure of a pala is very flexible. It's not mimetic. It definitely does not want to recreate something, uh, but it, it is symbolic. And uh, the flexibility of the structure, the malleability of the structure allows it to incorporate elements that perhaps not possible in proscenium theatre. To give you an example, an audience member is encouraged to enter onto the stage at any time during the four hours or six hours performance of a pala to seek the blessing of the guru who is the lead singer or to do a charitable donation. And when he enters on the podium or on the stage, then the performance kind of falls. The guru, uh, the pala singer blesses him. And after he departs from the stage, then the performance resumes. Similarly, it is episodic in nature. So let's say it is performed at 10 o'clock in the night and will continue up to 4 o'clock in the morning. You can come at any time and you'll not miss anything because all the stories are old and uh, you see one episode when you enter, you leave, there are some other episodes and there is frequent improvisation. So there is that, you know, Brechtian element in it without noticing it. So uh, the I have interviewed a lot of Pala singers and they would say that they don't know so which verses they will utter on that particular night, which particular performances they'll say uh, they'll perform on that particular night. So they have a broad theme. They can also take questions from the audience. Audience can ask them that, can you perform this thing or can you tell us something about this particular culture of Jagannath? So I would say that the flexibility, the malleability is good in, in terms of Pala. It doesn't have a very coherent structure. It's definitely not mimetic. It's symbolic. 
thank you very much sir and uh, i uh, i really like the way that uh, you said that how pala is actually challenging the structures that were say uh, predefined in uh, performative arts uh, and my last question is to uh, professor mohan dangara uh, so you have uh, talked about how subjectivity and the uh, conscience so uh, how is the identity transformation reflected in the culture in the uh, dangara thabu community especially um, in regard to the uh, globalization and the globalization uh, and uh, say the presence also in uh, the social media so uh, so you are on mute sir so uh, sorry so uh, uh, thank you for the question uh, if we talk about identity transformation of the community then uh, basically we notice the changes uh, in the performance and of course in language like if we go to have a very authentic version of dangara tharus then uh, only those people like nowadays who live still in the dang valley only they can speak very a uh, kind of uh, like a native a primitive version of their language but all those who have migrated from that valley uh, they do not speak the way actually their ancestors uh, used to speak and then still people who live in that area they speak so of course in terms of uh, linguistics also we find change then uh, in terms of uh, race also and most of the male members of the community they have almost like uh, given up the uh, traditional uh, dress uh, and if we talk about like females uh, they uh, wear but uh, uh, like uh, they only wear those kind of uh, dresses at their traditional attire during very specific rituals and uh, whenever they perform any rituals or especially uh, folklore or dance says uh, nowadays uh, like uh, they talk about agency more of their culture uh, more of their his, uh, history they talk about agency uh, and uh, it started after 24th august of 2015 so there occurred a kind of unwanted incident in a place called tikapur in kailali district where uh, like that community uh, the the community had organized a kind of big uh, demonstration so it was like very unwanted incident where almost sudden like the mob was out of control and seven people uh, like died and all of sudden the tharu leaders like they were arrested and then all of sudden they were blamed uh, for a kind of uh, agitation uh so after that and uh, as the community members they are becoming literate uh, somewhere in their every uh, performance they instead of just talking about their regular lives they have very improvised version of their uh, songs and dances where they like carry, where they like imitate uh, a kind of uh, so dramatic performance of sapre uh, like sapresar and uh, sapresh uh, so this is how actually if we talk about like transformation in identity performance then actually uh, the performance of that community has become more a kind of resistance a kind of political resistance and uh, social resistance so just from uh, the performance of their performance tharu community's performance uh from like ritual is shifting towards kind of political uh, resistance and uh, a kind of improvised versions of the songs uh actually in the past the community uh, they did not used to have any kind of particular singers or very individual performer uh, every performance uh, used to be like performed by the collective members so still now there are not a kind of very specific singer or dancer every kind of rituals are performed collectively but the lyrics uh, used in them and the narratives uh, so used in their performance 
they have become a kind of a more uh, assertive academic uh, and resistive and more political in their sound this is how uh, performance have been changing and they are changing thank you Thank you so much for answering to the question, sir. And uh, I truly believe what you said that agency plays a very important role in identity transformation, especially if we talk about the any minority or ethnic uh, community. Like how Spivak had said, can, uh, can the subalterns people are the uh, elites talking instead or in place of the subalterns? Uh, thank you so much, sir. So uh, with this, now we come to the end of today's session. Uh, I would once again like to say that we are calling for submissions of stories, essays, and poems and project architecture and submission guidelines. Visit www.tellmeyourstory.biz. Uh, I extend a heartfelt thank you to Guru Sajam Lowen, Dr. Andrew Alter, Dr. Arjun Raina, Dr. Umesh Kadra, and Professor Mohan Dangaura for this wonderful and remarkable session. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, I hope that we would be fortunate enough to collaborate with you in our future projects. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.